Bueno, uno de los, buenos días. Uno de los temas principales de este congreso que es la inteligencia artificial aplicada a las, a las artes y a las artes, eh, cuando hablamos de las artes, hablamos de las artes en general, artes visuales, eh, música, narrativa, el lenguaje, etc. ¿no? Eh, se escogió este tema porque desde, últimamente eh, las aplicaciones a las artes son, han cogido mucha importancia dentro de lo que es la inteligencia artificial. Hay toda una área que se llama creatividad computacional, se trata de intentar modelar eh, los procesos creativos que llevamos a cabo las personas. La inteligencia artificial siempre se plantea a sí misma desafíos importantes, todo lo que tenga que ver con actividad inteligente y las, las, la, las artes, la creatividad, son, es en sí mismo un ejemplo eh, pues, prototípico de lo que sería eh, la, la, la inteligencia, ¿no? la demostración de que algo es inteligente, eh, no hay duda de que se demuestra cuando algo es creativo. Eh, en este, esta conferencia, en este congreso, hay varias actividades relacionadas con, con el arte, en particular ahí se presentan eh, del orden de creo que son 16 trabajos eh, directamente relacionados con el arte, como decía antes, música, artes visuales, eh, narración, lenguaje. Eh, estos 16 trabajos fueron seleccionados de entre un, un, un grupo numeroso de muchos más trabajos, del orden de 50, eh, con lo cual son una, son, había un, era muy estricto el proceso, lo que significa que son 16 trabajos eh, realmente importantes. De estos 16, eh, hay dos que, que recibieron, bueno, que, son los, los, que se considera que fueron los mejores. Eh, tenemos a dos de los autores eh, de cada uno de los trabajos eh, también aquí en, la, en, esta, en esta rueda de prensa, por si eh, eh, fuera necesario dar algún detalle adicional o si no para más tarde puedan contactarles, eh, que están sentados aquí en, la, en, la, en, en esta mesa. Eh, uno de los trabajos tiene que ver con la música y está relacionada con la fusión de acordes, cómo eh, descubrir nuevas cadencias o progresiones de acordes musicales eh, a partir de unos acordes iniciales que se, que se fusionan y dan lugar a, a nuevos acordes más complejos. Y bueno, entre otras cosas, eh, ha, ha descubierto acordes eh, que, eran, que representaban cadencias eh, bien, eh, bien establecidas o importantes que en la historia incluso de la música de jazz, por ejemplo. ¿no? El otro eh, trabajo tiene que ver con las artes visuales eh, y se, es, se, se, se dura, mirando al trabajo, a Mondrian, Mondrian el, el artista visual, eh, Victory Boogie Boogie, What Do I Feel, tiene que ver con un sistema basado en, 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 en computación, en, en visión por computador y, y también análisis del texto que describe el trabajo y se estudia la influencia de cómo eh, el, el tener acceso a un título, del, al título del trabajo o a una descripción eh, textual del trabajo, cómo influye en la percepción de sentimientos más o menos negativos o positivos acerca del trabajo, que es una obra de arte abstracta con lo cual en sí mismo, sin el acompañamiento del texto, pues sería bastante más complicado seguramente de percibir eh, la, 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 la impresión, ¿no? el sentimiento que, que nos transmite. Eh, también es importante decir que en este, en, esta, en este track, en este bloque de trabajos sobre inteligencia artificial y arte, eh, tenemos a uno de los eh, conferenciantes plenarios invitados, que es el profesor John McCormack, que está, nos acompaña también, eh, y yo lo, lo voy, le voy a dar la palabra a John para que, para que nos diga brevemente eh, acerca de su trabajo y de la conferencia invitada que tendrá lugar mañana a las 2 de la tarde. Uh, John, yeah, if you are ready, you can say a few things about your, your, your contribution. Uh, thanks, Ramon. Uh, unfortunately, I have to speak in English, not Spanish. But um, so um, my my talk will really be about uh, creativity uh, and the arts and the role of AI in that. I think in recent years there's been a lot of interest in the idea of computers uh, excelling the best human artists. So when will we see you know the works of Shakespeare, the equivalent of the works of Shakespeare made by computer? When will we see paintings better than Leonardo made by a computer? And I, I think this is 
completely the wrong question to be asking about AI and the arts. Um, uh, particularly in my own work and the work of many of my colleagues, I think we're seeing something very different emerging, which is um, the way that AI is actually changing people's creativity and uh, enhancing people's personal creativity. And I think this is a much more worthy goal to be trying to think about how we can use artificial intelligence to make people more creative rather than trying to defer our creativity exclusively to machines. Um, so I'll be looking at that and looking at some of the, the ways in which research is really contributing to this idea of being able to um, uh, uh, make things that you've, you know, humans have never been able to make before. And we can only do that if we collaborate with machines. And it involves a shift in thinking um, from thinking about a computer or a machine as a tool to being a collaborative partner. So throughout the history of art, many people have had collaborative partners that they've worked with, that have supported them, assisted them, mentored them, and so on. And I think if we start to envisage AI in that sense, we've got a much better chance of, of actually doing something very significant. Um, finally, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, uh, the way that a lot of AI is currently used, which I think is quite dangerous, and that's uh, where we simply defer all of our creative judgment to computers. And particularly, um, the kind of creativity that machines currently exhibit is very different than human creativity. It encourages us to uh, rely on them for things like um, recommendations. So if you, you know, if you go into any music site, you get recommendations about what the computer thinks you would like. If you go onto um, Facebook, you get advertising suggestions about who the computer thinks you are. And I think it's, this becomes more and more prevalent and the AI actually becomes better. It becomes more and more dangerous because people will rely so much on the decisions of a machine rather than the joy and um, the, the knowledge and experience of actually discovering something for yourself. So um, I just send a kind of warning note about that direction. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is another important event going on in relation to this track. Un evento muy importante relacionado con el bloque de Intervención Artificial y Arte y es una, una exposición en el Centro Cultural Borges, aquí cerca del, del hotel, en donde se, se pueden apreciar uh, siete contribuciones artísticas uh, relacionadas que están basadas en la inteligencia artificial. Una de ellas, por cierto, el, el artista es el es John McCormack, que acaba de, 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 de hablarnos de su, de su percepción de, de la inteligencia de la creatividad, pero hay, hay otros seis, algunos relacionados con robótica, otros con artes visuales también, eh, lo cual yo pienso que es, es, es muy importante eh, que, sea, que se pueda asistir a esta, a esta exposición. Se hizo con la idea de proyectar hacia la ciudad de Buenos Aires eh, el Congreso, abri, abrirlo a la ciudad que la, las, las, las personas de, de, de Buenos Aires o quien, quien esté visitando la ciudad pueda asistir a esta exposición y tener un, una cierta idea de cuáles son las, las contribuciones de la inteligencia artificial al arte. Está durante toda la semana esta exposición, hasta el jueves por la noche y es durante todo el día, eh, lo cual pues, yo animo, animo a todo el mundo a que, a que la visite. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you, colleagues. Um, next up, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Barbara Gross. Uh, Barbara uh, is a long-standing professor at Harvard University and uh, is, amongst many other things, uh, this year at Ichikai, the recipient of our Research Excellence Award, but that's not what we're going to hear about today. Today, Barbara is going to be telling us about work that she's been involved with on the 100 Year AI project. So, Barbara, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the AI 100 study on uh, 100 Year Study on Artificial Intelligence. Um, this is a project that was established at Stanford University about six or seven months ago through a gift from Eric and Mary Corbett. And um, uh, so let me say first what the 100 year study is. It's not a study that's going to take 100 years. It's a study that's going to be done over the course of 100 years. Um, 
the basic idea is that every five years there will be a one-year study. What will distinguish this, these studies from the normal kinds of studies that are done now by academies of science is that they will be done in the context of the 100 years. So each study will be one of a series and will take into account what's been done before and also look forward to what might be done in the future. So let me say a little bit, and I'll be talking about this tomorrow at 2 o'clock. So um, uh, I welcome you all to, uh, to come to that to hear more. Uh, the roots of this are in a 2009 study that was done when Eric Corbett was president of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. It was the Presidential Panel on Long-Term AI Futures, and the charge to that panel was to explore the potential long-term societal influences of AI advances. So, so to look at the successes, to look at potential socioeconomic, legal, ethical issues that could rise as, arise as we get competent machines, and to think about what people in the field should be doing proactively to make sure that the benefits were realized and the uh, potential negatives were minimized. There were three subgroups in this study, um, one that looked at what was possible over the short term, uh, the second looked over the longer term, and the third was focused especially on ethical and legal challenges. There were many findings from this. I will be saying something about those tomorrow. The most relevant one for um, the AI 100 project was that the endeavor of gathering people for two days to think intensively about this, then go off and in individual subgroups write about it, proved to be very valuable. So getting, getting people to think about it, um, to think about uh, what might be happening and what we might do. Uh, so what is, so, so from that, uh, Eric and Mary decided uh, that one of the ways that they wanted to make the world better was to endow this study. Uh, this study is, as I said, for a hundred years, and um, uh, just to put that in perspective, Ichikai is uh, 46 years old this year, I believe. Um, uh, the AAAI is 35 years old, and Ekai and Prikai, the conferences in Europe and the Pacific Rim are younger still. And none of us are 100 years old, so it's a long time scale. Uh, and as they thought about where to locate this, they decided not many institutions uh, last for more than 100 years, and they should situate it at a university. Um, John Hennessy, the president of uh, Stanford, said the reason they were happy to have this is that given, and I, now I'm quoting, given Stanford's pioneering role in artificial intelligence and our interdisciplinary mindset, we feel obliged and qualified to host a conversation about how artificial intelligence will affect our children and our children's children, so that, that looking forward. Um, the motivation is really that it's very difficult to, to anticipate now what will be the case in 100 years, what will make a difference to society, but by looking at this kind of syncopated rhythm over every five years, we might be able to help direct the ship uh, more, more beneficially. Um, this, the current state of the site, so it's just launched, there is a standing committee to oversee the study. Uh, this is uh, six people. I'm the chair, current chair of that committee. Obviously, the membership is going to rotate uh, over time. Uh, and the role of the standing committee is to determine for e each of the five-year studies uh, what the overall topic will be and um, who the chair will be and to work with the chair to establish who's on um, uh, the panel. Uh, let me just quote uh, Eric then. Um, it's our hope that the study with its extended memory and long gaze will provide important insights and guidance over the next century and beyond. So the status now is that the standing committee has met uh, once in person and several times virtually, and um, uh, we are in the process of defining the first study panel and identifying the first chair. Um, you can hear more, as I said, tomorrow. Uh, the session tomorrow will begin with a, about a, uh, the first half of it will be informational, and then I will be engaging the audience and helping us define the study. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, and to wrap up, I'd like to, introduce, like to get Ramon to introduce uh, some of the work, some of the papers that are going to be presented uh, in the main conference. So, Ramon. Yes.
Uh, when I said earlier, there are two papers. Como dije antes, hay dos artículos uh, que son especialmente eh, de calidad porque fueron los mejores de los de todos los, de los artículos relacionados con eh, interactividad de arte. Y como tenemos aquí a, a los autores, de, de, a un autor de cada uno de, los, de estos artículos, de estos trabajos, eh, les voy a pedir que digan uh, den algún detalle más acerca de, de estos trabajos. ¿no? Uno, eh, como dije antes, el título en inglés es Looking at Mondrian's Victory Boogie Boogie, What Do I Feel? Y tenemos al profesor Niku Sebe, y Niku nos va a, a dar alguna precisión más. Please. I don't really speak Spanish, but uh, well, I will, I will try to do it in English. So, as Ramon mentioned, uh, what we are looking explicitly at is, is uh, abstract art, and uh, we are looking at a um, combination between the visual information that you get from abstract art, and visual information is quite important in abstract art because artists are using low-level features like shapes, colors, composition to convey emotions, and we are also looking at the textual information, the title of the description, and some descriptions that are um, gathered either from, uh, from um, uh, critics of art or from, uh, from the amateurs. And, and we are putting this together in order to, uh, uh, to assess the emotion that is conveyed by the, the artwork. We are looking at two different uh, types of artwork. One is a professional uh, art collection from uh, a museum of, uh, of modern art of Trento and Roberto. And there we have a collection of about 1,000 uh, paintings uh, from uh, known artists, including Kandinsky and other people, especially Italians as well. And then there we are. We have the help of the museum to annotate and to uh, to assess the, the to, to, to get the ground truth of the emotion conveyed by the art. The other collection is a collection we we uh, we gather from the internet. There is a, a site of amateur art called Deviant Art, and there there are uh, amateur artists that put their work, and then there is a um, uh, a log in which people comment on this work. So we are we are we are in the text and information from there. That's uh, that's about. Thank you very much. Uh, el otro trabajo eh, se titula Computational Invention of Cadences and Chord Progressions by Conceptual Chord Blending. Y el, tenemos al Dr. Manfred Epe, que es uno de los el, autores del trabajo, que nos va a dar algún detalle más. Manfred, thank you. Thanks. Um, yes, so we were looking at um, computational creativity in general, and there are many, I mean, there are many theories about how human could be creative, cognitive theories, and we were trying to find out which mathematical framework could be relevant to represent or to replicate something that is similar to human creativity, and we were applying this to um, music generation and automated um, invention of, of chords. And uh, yeah, the key question is that how can you combine musicological concepts in a meaningful way such that it can help composers or that can also um, fully automatically um, propose new harmonies and new chord progressions. And uh, yeah, we were also combining this with mathematical theory. So how can you combine mathematics and music and get something um, serendipitously, get something meaningful and, and artful out of it? Thank you, Manfred. Okay, so um, that about wraps up our press conference for uh, today. Uh, we'll be starting again tomorrow morning at the same time, 8 a.m., and we'll hear about some more highlights uh, of the remaining conference then. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>